Good evening, everybody. My name is Shannon Rose McAuliffe. I'm the manager of the student arts programs here at MIT. I'm joined by my associate, Theo Fields, and we're really delighted to introduce Julia Turnbull, who is going to talk with us about creating a budget for the nonprofit track of the annual 15K Creative Arts Competition. We'll talk a little bit more at the end about some of the other upcoming opportunities, activities, uh, workshops, things like that. But um, since Zoom fatigue is real, I don't want to belabor the beginning. So I think I'll turn it over to Julia to do a quick intro and then we'll get things rolling. All right. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you, Theo. Um, so first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate this evening um, and asking me to speak about this topic. I think it's important. And um, there are many great resources here at MIT and in the community to help you get started with this. Um, so before we um, go ahead, I'll just a couple of things. If you have questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat um, or you can raise your hand either with the raise your hand feature or like the old fashioned way because I sometimes forget. <laughs> just raise my hand on the screen. Um, you know, and also this is designed to be conversational. So please feel free to just ask questions, share. I know this is being recorded, but I think um, hopefully we can all kind of respect some basic things of confidentiality or, or just being respectful of each other's um, questions and comments and time um, since this is a, a learning environment. So, um, and then one other note, um, there are lots of pictures in here. Um, they're all pictures that I've taken at different points in my travels. Um, anyways, I didn't take them from the internet or something <laughs> uh, like that. So anyways, um, we will get started. Um, let's see. Hold on, too many screens here. All right, um, introductions. So I, as Shannon introduced me, my name is Julia. Um, I work in the Legatum Center for Development on Entrepreneurship. And the Legatum Center is situated within Sloan, um, but actually started out under the School of Architecture and Planning um, several years ago. So um, we are a center that supports um, all MIT students across the five schools as well as faculty and staff who are building inclusive economies through innovation-driven entrepreneurship. Um, so I've listed our website um, as well as our Twitter handle if you wanna follow us. Um, if you wanna go to the website and um, scroll all the way to the bottom, you can sign up for our newsletter and get some information about things we're doing. Um, we've had a couple of fellows in the past who have been involved in the creative arts. So you might recognize Rebecca Huey and Roots Studio. Um, we've had several from the School of Architecture and Planning, um, Kenfield Griffith, um, Ella Pinovich, who started a jewelry company. So um, there's lots of lots of space here, um, many great opportunities. Um, all right, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I actually started off my career kind of in international um, development and global economics in Mexico, um, and uh, and learned a lot there about artisans, um, also people who are making a living through arts-driven entrepreneurship, um, as well as people who are just, you know, willing to, to try new things and, and learn those as well. Um, in terms of my creative skills, I, I don't have a lot. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate bright colors. Um, and, uh, um, I'm, you know, I'm actually in the process now of, of redoing my condo. So if anybody has any great um, <laughs> suggestions for, for ideas or paint colors or anything like that, um, feel free to share. Um, all right, we'll just go around. Um, Yu Yang, you, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Are you there? No, okay. It's okay. Um, I know it's dinner time. Um, he, um, I, I, or someone posted in the chat, so I think oh, okay. maybe not answering vocally, but in the, in the chat. Let me see. Okay, you're not just a student. You're also you're an entrepreneur. You're an artisan. You're involved in, in the uh, involved in the competition. Um, it's okay. All right. Um, well, so we'll move along. Um, feel free to to add anything to the conversation. Um, all right. Let's see. Oh, do you want to do a quick intro about you know why don't we all we can all get to know who we are, why we're here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I'm a first year MBA student um, coming from um, consulting and then uh, left that to join Wayfair, um, trying to get a little more of the entrepreneurial or startup feel in a business. And um, I'm considering uh, doing the some kind of uh, startup related work in the near future, but I'm doing the, the E&I track at Sloan right now. Excellent. Um, Shannon, do you have a favorite activity? 
Oh man. Um, well, the intersection of sort of passion and vocation for me involves singing and being a professor of music. But uh, when I'm not doing that, I love glass blowing. I'm terrible at it. But my favorite non-professional creative activity is probably glass blowing. Nice. MIT is known for that. I've heard I haven't made I haven't made it to the glass lab, but um, when campus reopens, that's sort of priority one. Yep, kind of a blue pumpkin. All right, um, all right. So one question I do have, um, just for people to consider if you're watching this asynchronously, is whether you have a hybrid model. So the things that we're talking about here might apply to the nonprofit side of your business model. Um, and if you have a hybrid model, hopefully you'll find some complementarities. I think with the workshop that's coming up on Wednesday, right, for for-profit uh, budgeting. Okay. Um, so you'll actually be kind of, you'll be joining these two um, themes together. Um, and the Lake Autumn Center, we do have some case studies on hybrid business models, um, which go beyond budgeting, but if you're interested, um, reach out and we can share those with you. So, all right. Um, so just some things we're going to cover um, in this session. Um, just the basics of building a budget, um, why it's important and what you may, what you should include. Um, and then as you go it, into fundraising, your budget will help you prepare for fundraising. Um, so we'll talk about some considerations you might want to take into account um, as you start to undertake that process. And then if we have time, uh, maybe we can go over building a budget and some fundraising tips. Um, if anybody has anything particular they wish to discuss. And then uh, we'll of course leave time for um, any Q&A at the end. Excellent. Before we jump in, I think I'm hearing a little feedback from someone. I'm. Um, it might be me. Hold on. It's probably, it's my radiator. Ah. Oh, that's what it said. It does sound like that now that you mentioned it. Down? Yeah. Uh, all right. Okay. No, not at all. Is it better if I, I try to move this computer away? Okay. Um, Either way, totally fine. I just wanted okay. to, it was, it was coming to my attention, but um, yeah, proceed. <laughs> That, yeah, doing everything remotely. These are the things we encounter. Um, all right, so what are some things um, that come to mind when you think about a budget? Um, you uh, Probably not like these lovely walls um, <laughs> in Frida Kahlo's courtyard, but um, there are a couple of things you just wanna keep in mind generally. So you wanna keep in mind categories, right? Um, so having a way to think about how you organize your financial information. You might organize it according to a project, um, you might organize it according to the type of expense. So is it a salary? Is it something physical, like the space or the studio you might be renting? Um, marketing expenses, which can be tangible and intangible. So um, we're now in this age of everything is, is online. So you're creating digital posters and all of those things. But you have to think about, um, are you using Adobe? Are you using um, a Mac product? What, how are you creating that? What is it costing you? Um, you know, uh, what are you um, getting maybe in kind or for free? Um, what are some things that you may be able to use as an MIT student or a student um, that are available to you now, but you would have to think about how are you gonna budget and pay for those um, maybe once you graduate or, or once you use up all of your Amazon Web Services credits or those kinds of things. Um, so just start to think about as, as you're building a budget, um, as you're paying for things, Think about what are the things that you absolutely need to provide your product or service? Um, and how much do they cost? And how much do they cost either on an hourly basis or on a per project basis, right? But start to think about, um, you know, you're, you're a nonprofit, but that doesn't mean you're not sustainable. Um, and I think that's really important to recognize that uh, nonprofit organizations have missions, um, but, they can, but they are sustainable organizations um, and they just have to, think and plan differently for how you match um, the costs or the expenses that you incur um, with the product or service that you're delivering to the market. Um, so that's kind of what, you know, I, I don't want building a budget to be a dry topic. I know it's not exciting. <laughs> um, I know that sometimes it's something we don't want to do, um, but I, I want you to think of your budget as a tool that supports your mission and your work um, and not something that's just another chore. There are lots of things that are chores. Um, but it's really something that's going to enable you to scale and grow um, your impact and what you're doing. All right, um, so building a budget. Um, 
this is going to be the first step in creating an accurate financial picture of your organization. If you start to build a budget, you will find that it's much easier to source your other financial statements. So um, your income statement or a balance sheet once you start to have those numbers, because then you have an idea of how you're allocating your resources and also what resources you need to scale and grow. Um, and you're going to find things will change over time. You're going to see where you um, have recurring expenses that you could reduce. So you might be um, renting something and after a while you realize it makes sense to purchase it. Or you may realize that um, a piece of equipment becomes outdated quickly and it doesn't make sense to purchase that piece of equipment. It actually makes sense to rent it long, time, long term um, or find a leasing model or make sure you get a maintenance program because that's where the real costs build up, right? So, you know, it's information and knowledge um, actually become really critical tools um, in making you a more sophisticated entrepreneur in terms of how you're maximizing your resources. Um, there's um, an, actually an artisan, she knits hats. She lives in Vermont, um, her name's Hannah. Um, and she has a blog called, Why Are These Hats So Expensive? And she actually breaks down, right? She takes the hat and then she kind of takes it apart and works backwards. And she says, this is how much yarn goes into the hat. This is how much wool I have to purchase. Um, this is how much dye I need, and, you know, and she really goes through all of those unit economics costs and then says, this is how I come up with the price of the hat. One thing that's really important is that she values her time, right? So she's an artisan, um, but she also says, this is actually what it, what it costs me. This is what my time is worth. And these are what my living expenses are. And she factors all of those things into the value of her time. So I think that's one thing. Um, it's very easy, especially um, for anyone who's a student full-time to think, uh, think of this as a hobby or a project, but you really wanna think of this again, going back to being a sustainable organization. Your people are gonna be your most important assets, including the founders, um, especially the founders. And so you wanna make sure that you're accurately valuing your, your time. And we'll talk about some different ways to do that. Um, but that's one area I think where people often um, misunderestimate their, their expenses, right? They don't value their time. Um, and then also, um, you know, as you start to think about what you want to accomplish, um, kind of what you are accomplishing and what you have to change to get there, um, a budget will actually help you realize, okay, this isn't what we need, or you'll, um, be able to recognize seasonal patterns in your income and how do you, um, match all of those things over time. All right. Um, so the key, you know, a budget is there are gonna be two sides, your expenses and your income. Um, so as I mentioned, it's really important to think about everything um, that you incur to produce your product or service. So if you have a loom, um, that's a recurring fixed expense, right? So it doesn't matter if you weave 10 rugs or 20 rugs in a month, you've purchased the loom and that's a sunk cost. Um, and then you're gonna have variable costs. So if you're purchasing, if you're making more rugs, you're gonna incur um, other materials, the thread, the um, dye, um, all of those different things. Um, thinking about um, if you have any anything that changes seasonally in terms of inputs or availability, um, demand, especially I think uh, space in Kendall Square is a huge one, right? <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a seasonality to that. Um, so those are just some different things you want to think about. So I think really understanding what you're producing from the beginning to the end um, and how that factors into your next um, either sales cycle or production cycle or whatever you're doing. So I don't know if anyone here is familiar with HubSpot's flywheel. Um, so they talk about the, the cycle of you're going to, um, you, you basically attract delight and then re-engage your customer, right? So you attract them, you bring them in, um, you delight them. So they're like getting a rug and then they discover, oh, there's like something, you know, when I look at it from the other side, I see a completely different pattern or the light looks different in the morning and it does in the afternoon, right? And they're kind of delighted by these features. And then you find ways to re-engage them, right? And so that's kind of the cycle um, that you want to look for. And you want to think about that, again, as you start to, to build your budget, what does that look like, right? I mean, think about um, a lot of other things that people will buy. Um, so shoes and clothing and um, meals, right? The, the things you buy on Saturday when you go out with your friends are different from what you get on Tuesday at lunch when you're just in a hurry. Um, so you wanna think about all of these different things and how 
um, they factor into your expenses. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, I, when you're starting out, I think that the easiest way to think about your expenses is in terms of categories. And you can Google these things. I mean, this is a pretty good list um, of kind of the different categories. Um, workspace is often a big one. Um, administrative costs, so those are all the things you need to keep going. Um, G Suite um, has a lot of free things for nonprofits. Hopefully you know that. Um, web hosting, the same, you know, you can find varying degrees. Um, things like snacks, if you're buying snacks for your staff, right? I mean, that's really, that's common in a lot of workspaces, but these are small things that people forget, um, especially as they start to grow or think about um, leaving the MIT nest. <laughs> um, but these are the things that are actually, you know, they're, they're important and they add up. Um, staff compensation. Um, this is one we talked about often, you know, you're a startup and maybe you can't compensate people yet. Um, but find a way to approximate the value of the time, right? So um, if you have someone who's in a managerial role, then find out what a manager in your same market is paid. Um, I mean, you can do that on an annual salary and do all the math and, and break down the hours, right? Um, but those are really good ways to budget for your expense. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of recording that back in as, as doing, you know, um, tracking that as time that's donated. Um, and then we also talked about, um, Oops. Um, in some cases, it makes sense um, to think about program and project expenses. So, um, and this is common in especially nonprofits that might have um, programs that are funded by multiple donors, right? So you have to start to allocate expenses to different programs and then you have to decide 50% um, of someone's salary is coming from this funder and 50% is coming from another funder, right? Um, or you may have funders who say, I'm really interested in um, visual arts and you may have others who say I'm, I'm really interested in musical arts right and you have to find ways to make those um, things work and I think tracking these expenses um, especially expenses that might be shared across projects is really important so once you have your budget you can start to figure that out because their um, funders for nonprofits especially are going to be interested in reporting and um, wanting to know the impact of their of their dollars, right? Um, so, yeah. So just remember, um, staff time is is incredibly valuable, and, and don't discount that, um, especially as you're in a startup kind of mode, right? Any other comments, thoughts? And these are just some like big categories, but. Um, you might find other categories are better for your industry. I think I really like the way that you're talking about really making sure that you're cognizant, even if you don't have the, um, the financial outlay capacities to pay people for their time, you've got to figure out like in a perfect world, how much does it cost to run this thing? So, um, you know, cannot overemphasize enough the importance of like, accounting for the snacks, accounting for the unpaid labor that should ideally turn into paid labor when there's capital for that. So thank you for that. Yep. Um, all right, we will go along. All right, um, income. So what, what do people think of when they think of income, right? Um, it's money that comes in, right? And this gets tricky. Um, so there's income, which is everything that comes into your venture. So that's prize money, grant funds, um, that volunteer, that like startup, that sweat equity, right? Um, anything else that might be donated. Um, but also think about what are the costs of accessing those, right? So you can enter into prizes, you can enter into competitions, you can spend time writing grants, um, but there are costs associated with that. And again, it's time, it's uh, um, what you need to produce high quality um, visual materials. If you have to produce videos, do you have to buy like those little like, just buy cameras for your iPhone? Um, all of those things all are, are part of your equipment costs and your production costs, right? So there's income, um, there's revenue. So that's usually what comes in from sales or from contracts. Um, if you're selling tickets, if you're selling art, um, whatever it may be. Um, and then there's also, and then profit is your income, uh, or pro, sorry, profit is your revenue minus all your cost. And then what's left over is hopefully your profit. 
Um, this gets tricky with nonprofits, right? <laughs> Ideally, you spent all the money, and that's what um, funders and donors want to see, right? If you have money left over, they're like, why is there money left over? We're not going to give you more money until you spend the money we've already given you. So, <laughs> um, so we'll also go over an example that deals with that. Um, but again, think about kind of all the different, there's all the money that comes in, um, and it's really important to track that um, because, as I said, it helps you understand your sources and uses of funds. Um, it also helps you understand, you know, how are you actually allocating that money um, and how can you show impact, right? So I think different sources of income usually have different, um, not usually, but sometimes have different um, impact metrics requirements, right? So understanding all of those things um, as you go into the process. And also thinking about, um, you know, you, can work with large funders, but what are their requirements? Um, do they want quarterly reporting? Do they want semi-annual reporting? Do they want annual reporting, right? And all of those things usually add up to someone's time on staff. Um, so if you're a startup, it's gonna be um, the entrepreneur's time. Uh, and, um, or maybe if you're lucky enough to have a UROP or an intern or someone like that. Um, but thinking about all of those, those different requirements and pieces, um, the other thing to think about um, with income, especially donations or grants, sometimes some large organizations will also have attribution requirements. Um, so they may want to, to take credit um, in terms of their impact and their reporting um, for the things you're doing. And it's a great way to get recognition. Um, it's a great way to scale, but it's also um, kind of thinking about what direction you want your organization or your venture to go. Um, all right, any questions? Okay. Um, one other thing to mention, uh, depending on um, kind of where you are or, or the organization granting prize money, sometimes it can be taxable. Um, so just especially if you're an international student, just beware um, of any, any potential taxation. Some organizations give checks uh, or give prize money to the individual who entered the competition others might award it to the organization. So just be aware of those, of those things. Um, all right, um, so, so many years ago, um, <laughs> when I was a graduate student, I worked with a lending organization in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, and they used kind of, they had an ecotourism model um, and they used that to educate um, visitors to Oaxaca about um, local, arts and the local economy and the local culture. Um, and then they also provided loans to um, micro and small enterprises, most of which were run by women um, either in the arts and agriculture um, or running small businesses like restaurants and providing services. Um, so this is sort of what I kind of just did a very rough budget of what their operations looked like um, and then kind of what they did, how they met their um, ultimate goal of supplying loans to artisans. Um, so these were kind of their three main sources of income. Um, so tours, um, so these were visits out to the villages, um, donations, so people who just liked the organization. Um, and then they also did some educational courses. So you could come and you could do a cooking course in the village, um, you know, it was a special day long activity. Um, they had, two people on staff, they had lots of volunteers. Um, so they had university students who got volunteer credit for building out um, their website or for um, creating a new logo and that kind of thing. So they made the most of, of those resources. Um, but these were their actual um, staff salary expenditures. Um, programs um, for tours, so there was uh, transportation costs that was pretty much a fixed cost every month. Um, and then lunches, which varied depending on how many people were on the tour. Um, and then for courses, uh, same thing, same fixed transportation cost. Lunches vary depending on uh, participation. Um, and the materials, so like I said, if you're, if you're cooking, that's all, like, that's all of the ingredients. If someone's doing weaving, it's all of the um, yarn and that kind of thing. Um, and then special events, so they would host dinners, small concerts. Um, their administration costs, um, so marketing was pretty low. They would just do Facebook ads, but, um, not not too bad um, website um, and then they did staff lunches for the volunteers every week um, and then whatever was left over um, so all the sources of income 
plus all the expenses um, went into this Lone Star Artisans category, right? So we talked about nonprofit, you <laughs> can't, be, can't be keeping profit and retained earnings and all that stuff, right? So at the end of the month, whatever was left over got converted into loan money. Um, because they were a nonprofit and not a lending institution, they could do this. And so the loans were basically, they got repaid, like it was great, but you know, they weren't um, uh, not under the same requirements as a bank or a financial institution. We do a quick talk about that, just a really glancing overview. I think nonprofit can often be perceived almost as a misnomer. And yep. like you were saying, loans to artisans, things like that. If you have any excess you know, income yep. over expenses, you're allowed to allocate that pretty much as long as it's in alignment with the stated mission of the organization. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you for, for clarifying that, yeah. so. Um, so that's kind of what goes back to your nonprofit has a mission, right? And that's why having these categories and these budget items. So as you can see, you know, programs that are offered, so tours and courses are broken out, right? And then administration applies to all of these. The executive director and administrator work for both of these programs. Um, and then at the end, like, yes, the loans are an expense. They don't necessarily come back, but all of these activities support this core mission. Um, and just to be, you know, and in some way, you know, you can see different um, people maybe outside, outside of the, um, outside of this world would say, oh, well, those are just, uh, it's basically charity. And like, yes and no, and that's more of a philosophical debate. Um, but I think the point is that, um, you know, there was clarity, there's transparency in what the organization was doing. Um, so all of those things are really important. This was a 5013C registered in the United States with operations in Mexico. So they have the ability to, um, to collect these funds um, from donors in the US and then administer them um, in accord with, with the stated mission and purpose. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, there are lots of different ways to, um, to do this. You, you may not be doing that or you may not be facilitating a lending program, um, but just thinking about, you know, that's really the purpose is you're creating value and how are you um, sharing that value, right? So, yeah, and I, I worked in a hybrid organi organization as well. Um, so if anybody does have a hybrid um, they're thinking about, you know, we can talk more about that um, offline. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of different ways to, to do this. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, uh, one thing I think that applies, and this goes back to sustainability very much to um, for-profit and non-profit startups, is that at the beginning, um, you will be maximizing the talents of the individuals who work in your organization, um, so you'll really be playing to their strengths. Um, as your business starts to grow, then you'll find you'll, you need to look for individuals who have more specific strengths. Usually, you're looking for more senior um, managers or maybe a, a highly specialized skill set. Um, and so just thinking about, you know, as you start to allocate those expenses and those salaries, right? So you, you may have someone who does something, teaches a very specific course um, or is an expert in something that has to do with tours or, or marketing. Um, so again, just thinking about, but once you have these categories, you can then make a decision about how these people, their people spend their time or how um, equipment and different resources are used in the organization. Yeah, income, income is almost always the easiest part to figure out. <laughs> you have money's coming in, hopefully it's going into one of these categories. Um, this stuff can get a little bit trickier and as your organization grows, these, the categories may change. Um, so this particular organization looked at transportation and after a time they realized, hey, we're actually better off if we buy our own van, right? This is a recurring expense and there are a lot of things that, uh, that we could do if we didn't have this lump sum um, every month going out, right? So, um, so those are things that are really useful. The other thing um, is to recognize their seasonality, right? So down here, they, they are a really lean organization um, and they could just make loans to artisans every month. But you might have a month that's negative and the next month is positive. Um, and then you balance that out at the end of the quarter or the end of the year or whatever your um, tax situation is. And there's seasonality, right? July and August, you have a lot of tourists. Um, or July, you have a lot. August, you have a lot in the beginning, not so many in the end. 
And then in September, you have um, a bunch of retired teachers who love to travel. <laughs> In September, I mean, that was the seasonality of this business, right? So they always knew oh, we'll get a bump up in September, right? Um, all right. Um, all right. Um, any questions at this point? All right. Um, one thing is, you know, especially if you're a startup and this applies to for profit and nonprofit. Um, if you have early clients or people who are interested in what you're doing, ask them to fund this. You don't have to say, will you fund my first project? But you can say, we need a deposit or we need 50% upfront, right? So figure out what your costs are or what you need. Um, and maybe you like really need that Adobe license. I mean, you shouldn't right now because you can get it for free from MIT. But maybe you really need something. You need a camera. You need um, a technology license. Um, and you don't have to say to the client, will you give me the money to buy this technology or I need the money up front for this technology license, but you can use your budget and you can use your expenses and you can say, okay, this is a fair deposit price, right? We're asking for 50% upfront. Um, so, but again, having this is having a budget is a good way. It's also great um, when you start to fundraise, if someone, if you're, you need a thousand dollars and someone says, we can give you 500, but what can you do with that? then you can say, okay, these are the things that are nice to have, and then these are the things that we absolutely need um, to be able to move forward and produce this, right? Um, but having that, that knowledge and information um, and being able to put those project budget expenses in an appendix if somebody asks to see them um, definitely gives you an advantage. Um, all right. Um, so we can spend a little bit of time. Um, so fundraising, um, obviously uh, MIT is a fantastic environment um, for grants and prizes. Um, anything that's um, non-dilutive um, or isn't incurring any debt is fantastic. Um, and also you said this is a great time to focus on the sustainability of your models. So um, any nonprofit that's successful long-term is has some kind of sustainability into their operations um, and has people who, clients who find value in what they're doing, right? Um, Always evaluate whether your mission aligns with that of your funders and donors. Um, I think we're at a time where it's really apparent why we need to do this, um, also at a time where it's easier than ever to do this. So um, there are a lot of tools out there um, to evaluate. People are pretty honest now through all kinds of, of mediums. Um, but just make sure that what you're doing is aligned and that you know, you're not gonna be experiencing mission drift or um, or things like that. Um, consider reporting requirements and attributions. So I've heard from different nonprofits, maybe um, not necessarily in the arts, that sometimes getting a little bit of money from a really big name donor um, can actually be very burdensome, right? So really think about what the value of that relationship is um, beyond just a donation or a grant. Um, make sure, especially with grants now, um, some of them can be recoverable grants. Um, so those would that would be income coming into your budget. Um, that would also be something that lies on your balance sheet and your financial statement, right? So if, you're, if you take off in five years, um, some organizations can say, hey, remember us? We gave you your first big grant. Um, so just keep those things in mind. Um, they're great. Um, but as, as you start to um, track all of your sources of income and your expenses, um, don't lose sight of that. Um, one thing is, I. This is tricky with measuring uh, and evaluating the impact of what you're doing. Um, you should, especially at the early stages, you should have some kind of key metrics that you're tracking and defining, right? Um, so that's one thing that really sets um, nonprofits apart. And, and for-profit ventures do it as well. But um, I think you can really, dim if you can demonstrate the impact of what you're doing, and if you have good metrics that make sense, um, funders and donors will be more likely to work with you. Um, there are lists, so you can go to the Global Impact in Investing Network. I, there are all kinds of lists and frameworks out there for, um, for impact, but just make sure that you're choosing what makes sense for you. Um, and I think it, and it's okay to start with some basic things, and then if you want to start, and then you can start to think about things that might be more of a stretch. So maybe they're difficult to measure right now, or you're not doing them, but you can also use those to set goals for your organization. Shannon. I think that's an incredibly good point. Um, a lot of the value added, I think, of the 15K compared to some of the other contests is that 
we do a sort of emphasis on storytelling and narrative and qualitative points because a lot of the arts, it can be a little trickier to nail down some quant data, but quant data benchmarks impact evaluation are incredibly important for right. ongoing viability and sustainability. So even if you're perfecting your pitch and perfecting your talking points, you've also still got to be able to show that it's working and you need to know how you're going to measure that it's working. So yep. incredibly important. Yep. That, that and then along getting um, like any kind of client testimonial like, um, is really, really important. Um, yeah. So, so anything you can do to have that kind of qualitative feature as well as that quantitative um, is great. Um, there's a, um, a journalist, she was a journalist in residence with the Legatum Center. Unfortunately, um, COVID hit and she's now, <laughs> she had to go home to, um, her, to Alexandria, Virginia. Um, but she does write a lot about local entrepreneurs all over the U.S. Um, she has a, um, a website called Times of Entrepreneurship. And so, and she also lists um, local resources for entrepreneurs. When I say local, I, I mean in different regions of the U.S. Um, but she's a great person and if you're doing something really cool it's worth following her and like letting like raising your hand on twitter or whatever <laughs> and saying hey I'm, I'm doing this cool thing that's providing jobs for our artisans in the us or or creating a platform or getting recognition for what they're doing right um so also um you know i, I think we're we're in a time now where everything's online um but i've also seen people make really great connections whether to funders or donors or, or just key talent by um, using those different channels that are available to you. Um, I think that the adage of you ask for advice and you get money and you ask for money and you get advice probably applies, <laughs> uh, applies across the board. Um, so um, a few other things on fundraising. Um, think about if you have co-founders, um, think about your relationship with them. Um, how everyone is contributing to the team um, and what each team member's goals are. Um, so that's really important as you, as you start to um, think about growing or scaling or what's next. Um, the structure, so right now you might be a nonprofit, but in five years it might make sense to be a hybrid or you might find that, um, and this happened when I was at Root Capital, what's considered a nonprofit operation in the US is considered a for-profit operation somewhere else. Um, so kind of being prepared to adapt and again that goes back to what is your mission right what is your goal um, and who's either funding you investing you um, or supporting you um, yeah so I, I think that's about uh, about it any questions any thoughts on fundraising or things? all right um, good luck <laughs> um, so feel free to reach out with questions. Um, I, this is a, a general high level overview, but um, if anyone does have more specific questions or, or would like to talk through anything or additional resources, um, I'm fine if you, if you want to reach out via email. So. Awesome. Um, right. We have a couple of questions. If you don't mind sure. some Q&A now, does that yep. work? That works. Um, so you hit on something about um, budgeting for operating, budgeting for expenses. And I was sort of thinking that there's a lot of baggage surrounding the sort of lean nonprofit mentality and that really negatively impacts specifically arts driven nonprofit orgs. So like how, is there any more specificity you can give about recommending budgeting for general ops and other expenses in case you have donors who strongly prefer that their funds be restricted exclusively to program use? Yeah, um, that's really that's really challenging. And I think one of the things that um, can help entrepreneurs with that is um, going back to this like impact met impact metrics, right? So if you show that to deliver a program, um, you have to have space, right? You can't you can't. Well, hopefully we're returning to to non COVID world, right? Um, so so right now, like renting an office space is maybe hard to justify. Um, but if you're thinking, you know, like we actually need a space because we um, we have we have a program and people, for example, need to be close to a T, right? So if you're running a, an arts program for children after school, right? They need to be close. They probably need to be close to a certain location, right? There's a convenience element there, and I think having um, understanding to who for whom you're providing services and what are the true costs that go into that um, and the, the value of what you're doing um, can help. And, and some some funders might kind of um, 
notice they dig in their heels. They might be more resistant. One thing to be aware of is that sometimes large organizations, especially, um, have one set of grant requirements and they will kind of just make all of the requirements the same for all of their um, receiving institute, receiving organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's where having a really good program officer, um, having a good relationship is key. The other thing too is there are some funders who are, who understand that and they're, they're willing to fund those things. And I think um, being savvy in your fundraising and finding um, several good partners and some who it's like, hey, we have these operational expenses, right? And we mm -hmm. have to cover them. Um, in terms of your reporting, I, you know, you have to record your expenses um, on your books, right? So every time you have to buy a poster board or paper clips mm -hmm. or, or copy your paper, um, all of those things are line items on your books. But in terms of your kind of administrative expenses, you can also use categories to say, these are the things we're doing, right? So you, you don't have funders who are looking at like every time you bought kind bars for the office, but it's right. like, <laughs> you know, cause you, you know, the lights need to stay on right, but you the need toilet to paper on. in the bathroom. Right. Like, yeah. um, but I, I think if you can also find ways, and this is where you go back to allocating those expenses, right? Um, you know, if you have multiple donors or funders, it's like, well, you know, 30% of our electric bill went to this program because we ran classes for three days a week for a whole semester. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's what, that's what you need to do that. So, um, no, I, relationships are tricky. Um, <laughs> um, but you can manage them. And, I, and when I've seen those kinds of things uh, managed successfully, it's because um, everyone has very good information about uh, good information that allows them to demonstrate that like, yes, we, you know, we, we needed these kinds of operational overhead things, but this is how they directly contributed to the program. I think saying we're not charging 100% of this to this program, right? If you have the flexibility to do that, we're charging the 30% because your pro the program you're funding is 30% of all of our operations. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. One, one piece of uh, insight that may be helpful, um, for students watching this asynchronously or, or students now, um, what do you see as kind of the most common mistake that first time founders, students uh, typically make with budgets? And what, what would your advice be to correct that or get ahead of that? Um, I think one thing I see, um, and we, I talked about this already, is people not valuing their time. Um, and, and so I think, I think we talked about different ways to kind of benchmark that. So, um, making sure that that's accounted for somehow as you look forward to what it would actually cost to run your business um, or to run your organization as a business. Um, I think the other thing too is, is just all the like smaller things add up, right? <laughs> you just don't think about it. Um, and so I, I would say really just tracking like all of the expenses and all of the things that you need to do um, in a day. So I, as students, you have tons of resources available to you. But as I said, it's, um, and I, I've seen this when students graduate, it's the Adobe license that you need, um, or it's, you know, you're, you're no longer at MIT. And so if something happens to your computer, you can't just like go to ISNT and drop it off, <laughs> right? And, you know, it's a real thing. So, so knowing like, yeah, this is, you know, it's, I need a $2,500 computer to create this design or to do my work or to have the editing equipment or the, the video equipment that I need. Um, really being cognizant of kind of all those equipment costs that maybe you haven't incurred since you started the venture, but these are real things that you need every day to do that. Yep. Excellent. I think maybe one or two more. I don't want to overstay our welcome <laughs> or anything. Um, so how does one sort of anticipate creating balance? How do you safely assess risk when you're attempting to forecast things like revenue versus expenses, especially in a startup that has few, if any, guarantees of upfront financing? Yep. Um, so um, I think as we've seen in the last year, even, <laughs> even the best plans um, can go. Away. So one thing I will say during COVID, um, I've spoken with um, funders of all kinds of different um uh industries and the common theme has been we're not we're no longer looking at um 
performance for the last year, right? The only thing that really matters is what companies have done in the last six months to three months, right? And the ability to pivot or to use whatever resources are available to solve a problem and move forward um, has become much more important in terms of making a decision about whom or what to, to back or to fund. Um, so I think to that point, we're in a chaotic environment. I think understanding what expenses um, you might be, or what factors you might be able to, expenses and factors you might be able to control and what's beyond your, what might be beyond your control and, and just being very upfront about that. Um, and having backup plans. I mean, you can do sensitivity analyses, right? So, you know, worked in nonprofits where we had to do this because we didn't know what was gonna happen to a uh, currency or an interest rate in the local market. Um, and so you can actually do those. Excel is a wonderful tool. Or, it's not wonderful, but it, <laughs> it's not always wonderful, but it has the ability to allow you to, you know, you can copy your spreadsheets over. Um, you can do those forecasts and you can say, hey, if, if nobody, uh, nobody can come to our performance because there's a pandemic, but, um, but we have seen, and look at what other people are doing. Are there other performance models and what are alternatives and being able to say, okay, under these circumstances, we think we can still make this work. Perfect. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great piece of advice. And, and building on that, thinking about um, this competition more broadly, if you could think back on um, the, the businesses that you've seen and participated in, if you have one kind of uh, pearl of wisdom or, or takeaway for students competing in this competition, what would that be? Um, I would say really focus on your story and why you're the right person to lead this venture at this time. Yep. I think anyone wants to feel like you're going to do this regardless of, of where you land in the competition, right? So uh, that just underscored exactly what we're trying to do here. We're trying to be good storytellers and, you know, we're trying not to be so end game driven. It's yeah. really great if you walk away with the great big check, but it's also pretty great if you learn anything from these workshops, from the mentorship, from yep. the feedback. So, you know, um, ideally everybody tells a better story when they come out than when they came in. So thank you for that. Yep. So, yeah. So it's really about, you know, telling the story of the world you're trying to build um, and, pe and having people want to join you on your journey. So. Perfect. Yep. This has been fantastic. I really appreciate your time and the insights and thank you so much.